Street Fighter 2 is the greatest video game sequel of all time. Why? Because you haven't played the original Street Fighter. No one has. The gameplay I'm showing on screen right now is likely the first time you've seen the game being played. And you probably just have to take my word for it. It could have been footage of Final Fight and it wouldn't have mattered except for looking more fun. The original Street Fighter's inclusion as a minigame in Street Fighter 6 is likely the highest player count it will have had since its original arcade release. When you search for the history of Street Fighter, a noticeable amount of the results are for the history of Street Fighter 2. And when going through videos and articles on the history of the Street Fighter franchise, they basically go, there once was a game called Street Fighter. With that out of the way, let me tell you in exhaustive detail about Street Fighter 2. And that's why I got married to Street Fighter 2. Then, whilst on our honeymoon, they made some sequels, I think, whatever. It's so influential that it supplanted the first game to become the retroactive start of the franchise. And it's hard to blame people for dismissing it. Even if we take the best version of Street Fighter, the home cartridge version, okay fine, the arcade version, it's incredibly bland. You only had two characters, Ken and Ryu, representing the United States and Japan respectively, and you couldn't even have a mirror match, not that it mattered since they're handled identically, which is one way to solve balance issues. But okay, you might be saying other sequels have overshadowed the previous entries in a series, that doesn't make them the greatest sequel ever, and yeah, you wouldn't be wrong. Devil May Cry 5 was so good it made fans forgive and forget slash purposefully ignore the attempted reboot. The original Assassin's Creed is a prototype for Assassin's Creed 2, a game so good they made it thrice, then made 14 more, and cast polymerization to fuse it with Far Cry 3 until they had the Ubisoft open world game formula so perfected that parody reviews could be made about it, and it caused the stagnation of all their games and potentially bankrupted the company, but it has the line It's a me, Mario! which makes it an easy contender for best sequel. So, while Street Fighter 2 still wins the eclipsing the predecessor category I arbitrarily decided is important, it still has competition. But to find out what makes a great sequel, and therefore the best sequel, there's a couple questions we must first answer. Starting with the classic philosophical question of which game counts as Street Fighter 2. Is it Vanilla Street Fighter 2, the latest version from 2017? Is it Super Street Fighter 2? Turbo. HD Remix. Perhaps it's the Game Boy port. No, these questions aren't necessary, they're all Street Fighter 2. Yeah, you might be a little annoyed if your friend asks if you want to play some Street Fighter 2 and you're expecting Turbo Edition, but they pull out the ZX Spectrum port, a port so bad it apologises to you for how bad it is before you start playing, and rightfully so. But updating or porting a game doesn't make it completely different. Yes, I am claiming to know the answer to the Ship of Theseus question. All philosophical questions have answers, you just have to say them with confidence. With that out of the way, we can also answer a seemingly simple yet frustratingly complex question. What even counts as a sequel? Not every game is as clear as Riven, the sequel to Mist, officially titled Riven, the sequel to Mist. Nor does every series kindly number their sequels like Madden. At least we can all agree that the sequel to Final Fantasy XIII is Final Fantasy XIV. Wait, I'm just getting word that none of the numbered Final Fantasy games are sequels, and some are different genres entirely. But there are sequels to some of them, such as Final Fantasy X-2, also known as the best one. Okay, so that muddies the water a bit. What about odd naming conventions? Super Mario Bros. 2 being the Lost Worlds outside Japan. Is God of War Ragnarok the second, or fifth, or seventh game in the series? Red Dead Redemption is the sequel to Red Dead Revolver, but Red Dead Redemption 2 doesn't count because it's a prequel to Red Dead Redemption. The Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge, and The Thing the Video Game are video game sequels to their respective movies. What an odd thing to have happened more than once. So how do we determine a sequel? Vibes. That's it, do a vibe check and you're done. Personally, I looked at the various Kingdom Hearts games and decided that the sequel to Kingdom Hearts is Kingdom Hearts 2, the sequel to Kingdom Hearts 2 is Kingdom Hearts 3, and everything else is a fever dream the developers manifested after realising they'd created a game with a 100% female demographic who will pay them for anything if it means the cute anime boy is also standing next to the Disney character. Also, what's a sequel and what's a spin-off? Can a game go from 2D platformer to 3D and still be considered a sequel? Where's the line? Senran Kagura goes from a side-scrolling action game to a card battling game, to a rhythm cooking game. That series basically does what it likes. Speaking of which, the Sinbad Canada Wikipedia page makes me irrationally angry. Every game in this series is a different genre, yet two are explicitly called sequels, only one of which has a two in the title, and it apparently only counts as a spin-off if it's an etchy game. Suddenly, when they go from feigning ignorance over the sexual nature of the games to fully embracing it, then they're spin-offs, because they wouldn't want to sully the good name of the innocent Sideshow Kakarot series with its innocent and un 
Dragon's sexual bikini-clad water gun game and its sequels that have features such as improved breast physics and clothing destruction. <sighs> Look, I'm no prude. If anything, I'm happy games like this exist and think there should be more and better versions of this type of game. There's clearly a market for it, and anime women being exploited is always better than real women, but I'm trying to find out what is and isn't a sequel here. Stop being so coy, souped up cantaloupe. So yeah, vibes. That's how you determine a sequel. With that out of the way, let's look at the other elements of a good sequel and how Street Fighter 2 does it better than all the others, starting with the worst way to judge how good a game is. Profit. When a company makes a sequel, it's likely because they sat around and said, when we made this game, the chart went up. So if we make that game again, the chart will go up again. And then they high five and collect their bags of money. And whilst real life isn't always a 100% manga faithful adaptation of this scenario, it's not hard to believe. The sheer quantity of sequels that get vomited out lines up with this. Sequels have a reputation for being low risk, high reward. Now I'm no business person, but if we look at the list of best selling games of all time, there's not as many sequels as you'd expect. Sequels aren't guaranteed success, they have to work for it, actually be good, and the profit they make would therefore be a sign of how good the sequel is, I've decided. So how much money did Street Fighter 2 make? It turns out, Street Fighter 2 is the 4th highest grossing video game of all time, and the highest grossing video game sequel at an inflation adjusted 21 billion dollars. And since we live under let me just check my dictionary of words that make me sound intelligent capitalism, that makes it the best sequel ever, because profit is all that matters. Dungeon Fighter Online is the third highest grossing at 20 billion, likely surprising to westerners like myself who may have never heard of it, with Pac-Man and Space Invaders taking second and first respectively. Most of the other games on the list are live service and or mobile games. It seems the most profitable eras of video games were either the golden era of arcades before home console gaming really took off, or the modern day exploitative microtransaction era with games perfectly designed to activate your spending neurons readily available 24-7. Of course, Street Fighter 2 being successful only really matters in relation to how successful the first Street Fighter was. So how much money did the original Street Fighter make? Uh, we don't know. Like, the people behind the game don't have exact numbers? Interviews from a Polygon article on the history of Street Fighter had numbers ranging from 2,500 to 50,000 cabinets sold. The consensus seems to be, it, it did alright, it did decent, it's not embarrassed, but it didn't do amazingly. And in comparison, Street Fighter 2 is the fourth highest grossing video game of all time and the highest grossing video game sequel at an inflation adjusted 21 billion dollars. So now that we've established Street Fighter 2's financial impact as a sequel was like a hermit crab upgrading from a seashell to the Sistine Chapel, we can look at its cultural impact. Street Fighter does have an unfair advantage here due to being around for much longer. The cultural legacy of Ask Creed 2 can't be as easily measured, though like many video game series, it's not really permeated the rest of the cultural zeitgeist, and its big opportunity to do so with the Assassin's Creed movie showed the zeitgeist actively resisted it. But even if it were an epic to rival the works of the legends of cinema, it's unlikely to overshadow a game so influential that 33 years later with the release of Street Fighter 6, all 8 original characters from Street Fighter 2 returning was a major selling point. Street Fighter 2 is a game everybody knows about, you've probably played it, but even if you haven't you know the music, you've seen the cosplay plays, either the safer work kind or the very much dangerous for work kind. You might have even specifically seen the greatest bonus stage of all time where you beat up a car for no reason whatsoever. Street Fighter 2 also brought innovation to the stereotyping genre. Seriously, so many characters are overt stereotypes to an almost adorable extent. Guile is a jacked military dude, which is a generous stereotype of an American man, especially coming from a country that would have every right to be less generous towards Americans. Blanca being a big green hairy mutant is meta because it's totally wrong but plays into the stereotype that Brazil won't care, they'll just be happy to be mentioned. Ken is a hafu and therefore forgotten. They even stereotype themselves, E Honda is a sumo wrestler in a bathhouse, and let's not forget Dalsim. And that's everything I'm going to say about Dalsim. Did you also know that Zangief's placeholder name during development was Vodka? I'm going to move on from this point before I get Street Fighter 2 cancelled 32 years after it came out. My point is, how good or bad a game is isn't just down to its technical prowess or mechanical competence, but how it sticks in your mind. A game that you play for 20 hours and never think about again is one thing. A game you play for 5 hours and regularly think back to is truly noteworthy. But Street Fighter 2 did both. People played it so often in arcades that it became the 4th highest grossing video game of all time, 21 billion? And its technical and mechanical competence led to the 
fundamentals of game design used for all future fighting games. It created the fighting game genre. Fatal Fury was initially called a Street Fighter 2 clone. For a while, Street Fighter 2 was referred to as a new type of beat em up game because there wasn't a term for a pure fighting game yet. They were so ahead of their time that players didn't even understand the way they were supposed to play. The game was considered a potential failure at first because when it launched in Japan, players didn't understand that the purpose was to play competitively. People would play it solo, consider it okay but not amazing, and then move on. Only once word got round that it's a competitive game, or battle play game as they called it at the time, did it explode in popularity. The first game in a new genre should not be so well rounded, yet the foundational principles introduced back then are still the foundational principles today. Precise joystick controls, six button mapping, and the most fundamental design choice in all of fighting games. Combos. Any game that uses combos owes it to Street Fighter 2. And to top it all off, quarter circle forward and punch is an expected move in all fighting games to this day. There'll simply never be another sequel like it because no one will put so much effort into the sequel of a mediocre game again. Frankly, I don't know why Capcom invested so much into it. Putting time and effort into the sequel to the first Pokemon games makes sense. That's just pressing print on the money printing machine that's already set up. But it clearly paid off, and the process of game design iteration means that innovations in game design are becoming less common and less impactful. That doesn't mean it can't happen again, but if it hasn't happened in the last 33 years, I doubt it's going to happen in the stagnant waters of high budget games development we see today. So, in conclusion, Street Fighter 2 is genre defining. The design of all future fighting games and any game that includes combo based combat grew from the seeds that Street Fighter 2 planted. That includes the third highest grossing game in history, Dungeon Fighter Online, clues in the name. It can still be played and enjoyed to this day. In fact, in 2017, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo made an appearance at the Canada Cup as part of the Capcom Pro Tour. You can play it online today and still feel that competitive spirit that was felt in arcades 33 years ago. Or if you're me, you can get your ass handed to you by the AI. Street Fighter 2 is a game so outstanding, its predecessor is forgotten to time. As a standalone game, it's fantastic. But as a sequel, there's only one word that describes Street Fighter 2. Perfect!